Praise the Lord for the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. And that means so much to us. Uh, there's true confidence in that hope and in that resurrection. Uh, a, a hope and joy that you can't get from the world knowing that victory over death and the grave and sin has been accomplished uh, through Christ and that the justice of God has been satisfied. Justification is made possible through faith in Christ and His resurrection. And uh, we are thankful. Uh, and as part of our, our coming to faith, part of that coming to faith as per Romans 10 and verse 9 is believing that Jesus is raised from the dead. Not just He died for our sins, but that He also was raised bodily from the dead. Uh, not in, 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 in spirit, as some think, but also in flesh. And that's significant because that is a hope that we can have that we'll one day be given. We like these old bodies. Uh, we don't like what they do to us, but when they're working really well, uh, it's a great um, uh, tabernacle to house the soul and spirit in. And uh, for fellowship, enjoyment, expression, uh, that's not just something that you sense or feel, but you share. That's got to involve a body. And so we do that. We come together. We fellowship one with another. But there's a day coming when we won't have to part fellowship. Uh, we'll be with the Lord, and it'll be a perfect time and a perfect reunion. And we're looking forward to that. So we live with that confident expectation, that elpida, the Greek there for hope. We live with that confident expectation so that when our days are bad, our our weeks, sometimes they come in years, are bad. Uh, we have that sense that when it's all said and done, we're going to be all right because of what Christ has accomplished for us. We're going to be okay. We may not have a large golden uh, nest egg to lie back on or rest on. We may not have the best health. We may not always live out the last months or years of our life in the most uh, desirable environs. But in our heart, wherever we are, we have Christ. And we have that peace and joy. And whatever happens to the rest of the world, uh, when it comes to us, it, we can't be touched. Uh, because uh, we're not worried about our body as much as we are as concerned with the preservation of our soul that's in Christ. So we're thankful that he de- He's the preserver in chief as well. Not only the Redeemer, but He's also the preserver of our salvation. And we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, is for First Peter 1 and verse 5. And um, our passage here is, is going to be in Corinthians chapter 13, verse is 8 through 13. We'll finish off the chapter. Just a few uh, lessons in this chapter, but a bunch in the one that was leading up to it. So um, that's the way that goes. But I love this verse of Scripture as y'all turn in there in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Blessed or praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3. Who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again. First time through salvation. The second time unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. And so we're very thankful for that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll wrap up this chapter this morning. And I entitled this lesson under our study gifts and agape in the church, Putting Away Childish Things. Now, we're all a little bit of a child in us, and that's fine. You need to hang on to that. Just don't demand it of other people. But you hang on to that. some of the little uh, the things that you loved as a girl, things that you loved as a boy. And yes, we'll say that here. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Putting away childish things. T- topical numbers 828. Number 17 in the lesson in this series. Just to begin with, in 1 Corinthians, 
uh, true Christian love has an attitude and a corresponding behavior. That's significant. The golden rule. Treat others as you have them treat you. And then how did God treat us with unconditional love? True Christian love has an attitude that goes beyond, that starts before the behavior. None of us fulfill all of these attitudes and behaviors all of the time because we had just gone through a, a litany of things that we should do and things that we should not be doing in verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long, it's kind, it envies not, doesn't puff itself up, not vaunting itself. Verse 5 doesn't behave itself rudely, crassly, or unseemly. Seeks not its own. In other words, is not self-possessed that everything in the world centers around you or me. Is not easily provoked, which means you're not touchy about everything. You, everybody's got to walk around like you're on broken glass around you or, or whatever. Thinketh no evil. In other words, by thinking no evil... Uh, uh, you are not uh, trying to think bad about another person. You don't uh, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. That's a wonderful mm-hmm. thing. You don't get happy when something bad happens to someone, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. In other words, your unconditional love is like a blanket that that, that covers the imperfections of others, as you would hope that others' love in their heart would cover your imperfections, because we all have them, some form or fashion. Whether perceived or not, people can get the weirdest ideas about somebody and not even know them. A love be- believeth all things doesn't mean it's gullible, but you give the benefit of the doubt to others. You're not cynical. That's a terrible way to live. Love hopeth all things. That is, you're always seeing the glass as half full. And you have confidence that God will see things through in the future. Love endureth all things. And means that, you know, whatever it is, you're going to stick with it. You're going to stick with the person. You're going to do what it is. You know, to a degree, I'm talking about uh, moral living, of course. L- hope and love endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man or an adult, I put away my childish things. What are they? He said, but right now, while we still have these childish things, we see in a mirror darkly, not fully clear yet. But then face to face now, I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known fully, and now abideth, continues to abide, regardless of how much we know of truth, Faith keeps on abiding. Hope keeps on abiding. Agape or charity keeps on abiding. These three, but the greatest of these is charity or agape love. So let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless the word and our understanding of it this morning, this Easter morning, this time when we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior from uh, from the grave. And we realize that he was busy in the meantime, but we realize, Heavenly Father, that... Uh, uh, not only that, but uh, in his resurrection, we have that confident expectation that we too will be in the first resurrection because we are in Christ. Thank you for the blessedness of this day, and thank you for the blessedness of your continuing word that helps us to live the life after we're saved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, true Christian love has an attitude and a corresponding behavior. None of us fulfill all of these attitudes that I just gave a few uh, examples of. None of us do all of them right all of the time. We may do some of them pretty good and others a little tougher for us. But agape works to make them all come out as a reality in our lives. Uh, The reason why we fail, I know this may come as a shocker to you, but is because we are damaged goods. So we must confess to God our sins 
and accept his forgiveness for Christ's sake. That's First John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, that means to name what it was, that's to God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's present tense, which means it's for the believer. It's for the believer. An unsaved person can confess their sins all they want, but until they confess Christ, they're not saved. That First John 1, 9 is a passage as well as that most of that book written to believers. And so uh, we have to confess our sins, but God is faithful to forgive us, and he's just because of the sacrifice of Christ to forgive us. He's not just to forgive us because we did a little extra church work around the church, we put a little bit more in the plate, or we said a little longer prayer that time, or we did something good for our neighbor. He's just to forgive us based on the blood of Christ, and that alone. So no need for great emotional wailing. No need for great explanations. It's just all about Christ. It has to stay that way. When we mess up, it's all about Christ and accepting his forgiveness. And then Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 18, forgetting those things which are past and reaching forward to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you got to put it behind you. you got to obliterate. You can't do anything about it. And it doesn't mean that you won't sin again in some form or fashion. Most likely we probably will. We don't go out of our way to do it. We shouldn't anyway. But anyway, we all fail because we're damaged goods. So we must confess our sins and accept His forgiveness for Christ's sake. He wants us to go on. Christ doesn't want you worrying about something that He's already paid for. Just confess it. And that means that we're... Turning over state's evidence, showing God that we know what we did was wrong, and we're going to go forward for, for God. We need that confirmation. The Corinthians had a hard time admitting when they were sinning, and they just kept on and on and on, and they got to where they were, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, very carnal. They despised Paul for bringing this to their attention. They started calling him names, started making fun of his delivery of messages, they started making fun of his his apostleship because they didn't want to accept his authority and the word to bring this to their attention. However, if we are going to walk in God's grace, we must learn to accept God's correction. We must conduct our lives both private and public the way that God wants us to. And that's all. All of us do. Love is greater than works. Love is greater than spiritual gifts. And I don't mean like. And sentimentalism, I mean unconditional love. Agape love is an unconditional love. Uh, it is a virtue of patience. And some of these things are descriptions. Love is not just being around somebody and being friendly with them. That's phileo love. This is agape. Agape is huge. And just again, verses 4 through 7 are just some description of what that type of love looks like. It suffers long. It's kind. It doesn't envy. That is, you don't feel bad about somebody else getting something that you don't have. Uh, it's not something that puffs itself up. It's not rude. Uh, it's not keeping a score on offenses that others commit against you. It, it bears all things. It's just a wonderful thing, but it takes a while to develop it. First John 2, 5 tells us that through the inhale of the word, it starts to mature and to develop. But love is greater than works. Love is how we treat God first. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. It's how we treat God first. So keep, let's keep that in mind. Agape is God's core motivator for providing our salvation. As John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's God's core motivator. God so loved. But saddest justice had to be satisfied as we see there. Love alone does not save. We must believe and receive Christ as Savior as our as our sacrifice for sin. What you and I sacrifice apart from that does not cut it in God's eyes. As far as being a good witness for God before mankind, the highest achievement that you or I will ever come to is a demonstration of agape love. 
not even just given the accuracy of the gospel, though it should be given accurately, ranks as high as demonstrating agape love. Because God is more concerned about what you are than what your mouth says or what my mouth says. He's concerned more about what we are than what we do as far as works goes. And what, if we are what we should be, then we will do what we should do. So agape is God's core, motiv- core motivator in salvation. It's also the highest achievement in being a witness before mankind and powers and principalities. So that's why it is called not the silver or the platinum. It's called the golden rule. <laughs> Walking in love is the hardest thing you will do. I'm talking about agape love. That's the hardest thing you'll do. I mean, it is hard to do because look at these these uh, examples in verses four through seven. You could read those and say it's hard to be patient with people. It's hard to be kind when you want to sock somebody in the nose. It's hard to show that kind of love uh, when you don't have something that your neighbor has and you want it. It's hard uh, to not. Build yourself up higher than what you really are. It's hard not to be a little bit rude from time to time. It's hard not to be self-seeking all the time. It's hard not to get mad when somebody provokes you. It's hard not to keep the score when your husband or wife or friends have done something that hurts your feelings and you want to put that in your hip pocket and bring it back out later date. It's hard not to do these things. But when you do it, that is the highest achievement in Christian conduct. Walking in love is the hardest. Look what it led Jesus to the cross. <laughs> Not just to satisfy the justice of God, but it's a demonstration of his love for the Father. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. I'll just read this. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. Present passive imperative. Let this mind be. That's a, a verb and one word and a verb. Uh, who being in the form of God, though it not robbery. He was in a physical manifestation, incarnation. He thought it not robbery to, to be equal with God. You know, have you ever heard of the military? They have a thing that they have is called stolen valor, where you claim, claim to have won a bronze or a silver star, or a congressional medal of honor, and you bought them somewhere and you're wearing them around and you never earned any of them. Stolen valor. Wearing a ranger patch. Stolen valor. Wearing an airborne patch. Stolen valor. You wear only the what you have been given in your citations. Well, Jesus Christ wore the patch, the valor. He wore the medal of being equal with God, and it was not stolen valor. He is equal. He's God in the flesh. But he made of himself of no reputation. No, he didn't. He didn't hold it over people. He made of himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And became found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. That's love. So let's go on Paul's uh, writing here in chapter 13 and verse 8. Where it says, love never fails. He's carrying this, this on. That's unconditional love. It never fails. But whether there be prophecies and or tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. All right, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they shall be filled. And so once a prophecy is filled, you know, you don't need it anymore. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. These were temporary gifts until the Scriptures were filled up. The supernatural temporary gifts of the Holy Spirit, as talked about in chapter 12, were used in the formative years of the early church. They were necessary until the Scriptures fully came into being. The incompleteness of the Scriptures does not mean that the Scriptures were defective, 
but only that they were lacking in fullness. If you have a corn, and it look, it, the cob doesn't start out a full cob in the husk with a full pieces of corn in it, it starts off little tiny, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger. And when you have the silk, you have the pollination with the tassels, and you have the pollination there. The wind helps a lot with that. And the corn starts to develop on the cob, and the cob feeds it. The nutrition that comes up from the sun and through the ground and the corn develops. Well, the corn, just because it's little and undeveloped, doesn't mean it's defective. It just is lack in being full yet. And actually, Jesus uses that as a, as a parable to teach about uh, the fullness of his the plan of the Father. But the Word of God was not defective. It was just not all there yet. It was still being filled up. God had more to say, in other words. And what God had said was right, but he had more to say. The book was not finished. And so these gifts were necessary at that time. The temporary gifts had their purpose and their day, just as the gifts of the Spirit for the remainder of time, the rest of the church age and the millennial kingdom, will continue to go on. There are certain still certain gifts of the, of the Spirit, of course, that are being incorporated today and will be also in the future. And there's a day coming when they will no longer be necessary. There's a day coming when there's no longer necessary to have the evangelists or the pastors and teachers because we're going to be in the eternal state and we'll be in the presence of the greatest. All mankind will be, that, of course, that's saved. There will be no more deficiency then among God's children. When at that time, after the new heavens and the new earth, he comes down with the heavenly city of Jerusalem and is planted here and reveals himself to us. The son already has. The father will at that time. Until then, only the son has seen him. There will be no need for those who spoke prophecies to hold that office once those prophecies had been given and had been written down as graphe or scripture. No need of tongues or knowing languages that you didn't know once the scriptures were understood by foreigners. And secondarily, as tongues told of a baptism of a fiery judgment upon Israel as per Joel's prophecy, there would be no more need of that once the judgment fell on Jerusalem around 70 A.D., that was one of the things that they would hear, the Jews would hear, would be those stammering tongues or that of which they spoke of the Gentiles speaking the languages. There would be no more need of those who had the gift of knowledge. They, one of the temporary gifts was the gift of knowledge, as we've seen before. And that is to know things that had not been written and to have that knowledge. And it wasn't spiritual knowledge. It was just academic knowledge. It's the word gnosis here. It wasn't in the spirit of the the speaker, but it was in their mind. God put it in their mind. Things not yet written. Once that holy thing of God was written, there was no more need for people to have that gift. Now they had the Bible, or at least their version and their form of it at that time. Canon hadn't been put together of all the books of the Bible, especially the New Testament, but they had the Word. And if we didn't have all the books of the New Testament... If we didn't have all the books in the New Testament, could you take one book in the New Testament and live a godly life by it? Yeah, you sure could. Sure you could. You might be like Popeye and just have big forearms and tiny legs, but you could you could make it. There's a lot of Popeye Christians that are developed in one der- in one area, but not oh, super undeveloped in others, and so they like to you know brag about the souped up area and. You know, wear the hefty pants to hide the tiny legs or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, let's go on. I better. Anyway, these temporary gifts will be put away when the time comes. And verse 9 says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Paul says we know what God has said to us up to this time, and that's all that we talk about. That's all we've said so far. That's what we all we've prophesied or said to come to be uh, as things should be. 
We know in part, so that's the only part he says that we can tell. When we get more, we'll share it. It was given on a need-to-know basis. When you need to know, we'll let you know. That's the way God gave his word up to us. And then verse 10 says, But when that which is perfect or complete is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The word perfect is teleos. It means be fully complete. It's the picture of the oak tree versus the acorn where it started out of. Actually, it doesn't start with the acorn. The acorn didn't become the acorn just by being... It started with a very tiny, invisible, almost invisible little tiny seed. That's just the part that you see that's ready to plant, to take root, and then to sprout. But when that which is perfect, that is teleos, that is complete, which refers to the whole canon or the whole standard of Scripture has been given to mankind and written, when it is come, when we have it, then that which is in part, that is, those temporary gifts of the Spirit that propped it up until then, then they shall be done away. They're not necessary. I see it on television. I've been in these meetings many, many moons ago as a child. And I understand that the Word of God was the last thing that the preacher was interested in getting to in the service. What he was interested in getting to was the build-up to what would come out of it as a result. And that's always the way it was. The teaching and the edification of the body of Christ was always sufficient. But the good times was about ready to cut loose. I've seen people look like they were levitating in churches like that. I've seen little boys in suits with their eyes. All you could see was the whites of their eyes rolled back, looking straight up with like their necks were in a crick, holding Bibles and walking up and down. I've seen that before. That's creepy. No, I wasn't one of them. <laughs> All I was doing was hoping grand, grandpap, as I call him, I said, grandpap, get me out of here. I'm going off the cray cray. I wouldn't have said that. I would have gotten, he would have given me a, back in that day, your grandparents would give you a whipping. Nowadays, they give you a popsicle or whatever. So. I say beat them. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway. I believe in culpability. Well, my granddaddy did anyway. But anyway, Paul can better better stop here. Paul goes on to illustrate what he's talking about as he compares the maturing of a child into an adult. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood like a child. What do you expect a child to understand? I've seen too many adults talk to children like they were talking to just six-year-old adults. They don't have the capacity and neither do they have the desire to know. And it's just like water off a duck's back. It's just to make the adult feel better. Care nothing about the kids when they do that. Child can be very intelligently talked to, but we have to realize that their capacity is limited. Well, Paul says the church's capacity in understanding the things of God at one time was limited. So it acted within that limitation. As, as I've said, the book of Acts is not the best book to use to give a standard for how the church is supposed to look because the Pauline epistles, of which there are 13, more information has been given. If the book stopped with, at the third grade level, you'd never get past division. At least when I was in school, we had multiplication division in the third grade. We wouldn't have gone on to fractions because that's when the, the, the truth, though that was true, how multiplication and division and then, of course, uh, subtraction and, and uh, addition, those things were elementary. If we just stopped with the elementary, it would have all been true, but that's as far as our knowledge would have gone. But we were taught other things. Same thing with history. You were taught other things. It expands, expands, expands. And the scripture has a limit on how far it will, God will expand and how much he shares with us, but he will share it with us. And he did through these writers of scripture. 
But when a child is immature, they act like a child. And the church acted very immature in those days. And Corinthian church was a prime example of how immature they acted. The Philippian church, though, was one of the most loving of Paul's writings. In chapter 4, it became very petty. The book of Ephesians, Paul, as we're teaching here at the 11 o'clock hour most Sundays, not today, but most Sundays, they were very good and being trained in what they had been receiving from God. But when you get further into chapter 4, you see that some of them had gone into sinful per, uh, perversions and they had gone into what I call reversionism. They had become more like the Gentiles or the unsaved in their behavior and they were following foolish things, some of them were. In other words, they were in the city of Ephesus, and now that I'm saved, now that I know the fundamentals of the faith, now I know that I'm kept, then I'm just going to let my guard down, and they were letting their guard down and living as the Gentiles lived. We've been through the easy part of Ephesians so far. We're going to, it's going to hit the fan in chapter four. Because it was not so sweet. Okay, I'm just saying that. They acted childish. They didn't fully understand some things, but they knew enough to do right. The child who's immature as a child acts like a child. He understands it's a child, so we shouldn't be surprised because he's not fully, brain is not fully functioning, cognitive abilities is not fully functioning, physically they're not fully functioning. But when they become an adult or a man or grown up or a woman or grown woman, well, it's time to put away the childish things. We live in a society today that seems like it's that we're to be perpetually acting like children. Well, Paul saw the temporary gifts as childish things. The formative years of the early church had the spectacular gifts of the Spirit, which are here referred to as the childish things because they served to support a fledgling faith. It was a real faith. It was the faith, but it was a fledgling faith in the sense that it was vulnerable. We have bluebird a nest up here that my wife and I put up above the house. And you face them toward the east by northeast. And you fix them in such a way as to protect them from predators. And those... Uh, little little ones when they they put their they lay their eggs in there and once they're old enough they've come out and you'll start seeing them and fluttering around there at it and we have forsythia bushes right there where they can kind of get them a little bit of a activity area going on before but they call them fledglings you've ever seen the the owls when they fall out of the trees out it i've seen pictures of them and they'll put their nest hole over where there is a lot of um Pine needles, because when they make their first attempts, you know, she'll have to put them back in a few times. They're going to fall down, and they're, the little wings just are going as hard as they can go, and just <laughs> bounce around and get them back up or whatever. Well, the early church was fledgling in that sense that it was it was still crawling like a baby. And uh, it still had training wheels on it, as it were. It still had, his, I guess you could call it maybe crutches or whatever, but that that's what it was. And it was going to make it. It was going to make it. You know, a baby, a real baby, a, a human being, uh, they may seem like they're awful uh, uh, fragile in a way they are, but they're very, uh, they can take a lot. Cold weather, hot weather, now it's hard on them, but they can take a lot, babies can. Think of all the babies out uh, in the, in the cold places where the, uh, uh, the the people traveled going out west in those wagons and the people who went on those wilderness trails um, and how it is through the Appalachians and going into the Smokies with the, the people traveling westward uh, with all the hazards that were there. There were little tiny babies in those wagons. There were little tiny babies in those little uh, rough, hewed out cabins. And the eastern shore, when those first rough uh, huts were put together, babies, little babies in there, and they survived. Now, a lot of them died, but many of them survived. I'm just saying, 
if you keep giving the right care and the right nutrition, the baby's going to live. And Jesus says the gates of hell are not going to prevail against my baby church. And it didn't. And it survived. The baby's got a lot of immune, uh, autoimmune problems right now, I think, because of lack of teaching. But the church survived. And, but it needed a little bit of a crutch then. So these temporary gifts helped. They served to inform the believer of things to come that had not been written yet. That's the gift of knowledge. They formed the teaching for the evangelizing the world until the fullness of the Word of God was come into its own full maturity. Once the full Bible was written, it became the canon or the standard, the bar that we are to reach for understanding. And this is what the word canon means. It means a standard. From then on, our faith, our life of faith in God would depend on the Bible for instruction and the Holy Spirit for understanding truths and our faith to believe and follow that in obedience rather than spectacular demonstrations of supernatural power. God wants us to focus on Him, not the power. <laughs> the source, though the power is there. But these temporary gifts were very, very powerful, and they were very uh, mind-blowing to a lot of people. They couldn't handle them very well especially the gift of tongues, of understanding these foreign languages without going to school. These weren't inaudible or misunderstandable languages that you said because you didn't want the devil to hear what you were saying, as I've heard some say. I want that son of a gun to know exactly what I'm saying. I want God to bring holy hell down on him. That's what I want, and that's exactly what's going to happen. That prayer is going to be answered, not because I asked for it, but because it is the will of God. Because he brings so much misery into our family. He brings so much misery into your family. And, of course, people have to be compliant, but he makes it easy for people to be compliant. And it's, it's sad, but it will have its day. He will have his day in court. But Paul is writing that when the Word of God is in its completed form, then it will be as clear as my own face is when I see it in its full reflection. But for now, we see in a mirror darkly. We don't see real clear. You probably have through a glass. That's a mirror is what that is. It's not completely clear yet. It's, it's foggy. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. In other words, things will be clear to me at that time. And now about a faith, hope, love, these three, but the grace of these is love or charity. So we sum up the matter of the gifts and behavior. That the behavior is more important than the demonstration of the gift. That agape love behavior is the greatest. It's greater than having great faith like to move mountains. It's greater than having super hope or confidence in things. Love is greater than that because it's a demonstration of God to mankind. It's a demonstration of God's love for mankind to mankind through you and me. Nothing beats imitating the character of God greater than unconditional love. Learning about what unconditional love is and how it's seen, we saw a little bit of that earlier in this chapter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and your blessings. We thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for giving us the strength to be able to handle the difficulties of life, to handle the upset things that bother us in life. We are thankful that your word gives us great joy presently to help us to get through the difficult things that we deal with in our home and our lives. And so, Father, we ask you to help us to continue to receive your word for your encouragement, for our encouragement, and that we'll receive your word in such a way that uh, it will be reflected in our attitude and how we treat ourselves, how we treat you, and how we treat others. Father, we just thank you for this blessedness and the blessed day of our celebration of the resurrection of our Savior. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen.